Hey, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody tuning in. I'm sure some of you couldn't uh, couldn't wait to download, so you're you're up at midnight listening to this because we're always coming with the hottest scoop on what's going on in in CO2, and we're excited to be back with us today is Dr. Stefan Mueller. He's the principal economist at the University of Chicago at Illinois. Uh, he has an extensive background. In the energy sector, he's been with the university now for, for 20 years, and he's in the uh, Energy Resources Center. So, uh, Dr. Stefan, we're super excited to have you on. You are going to give us a lecture today. You are going to school us on carbon intensity, the CI score, uh, the space where you've really become an expert. And so we thank you for your time. We're going to turn it over to you. Why don't you just give the audience a little bit of your pedigree, how you found yourself in your current role, uh, and, and some of the work you've done in the past. Yeah, so my, again, yeah, Stefan Mueller here, and uh, I've been university for 20 years. Uh, most of it, I was actually involved in uh, life cycle modeling of, of energy systems, I have an energy background, and uh, set my, my foot first into an ethanol plant back in 2004 um, under a grant for the Department of Energy that asked me to look at energy systems and heat balances of putting in a combined heat and power system at an ethanol plant with efficient heat recovery, and uh, I wrote that up for the Department of Energy, and that got the attention of some life cycle modelers, um, notably uh, Michael Wang at Argonne National Laboratory and the GREED model, and um, you know helped him inform uh, some of the biofuel pathways that he had already developed. But I, I you know, was able to add some data to it at uh, at that time, and uh, I've been involved in life cycle modeling uh, ever since. Uh, you know, had a subcontract off and on with Argon National Laboratory um, for some of the Crete pathways and in for helping helping inform some some of the sub module of Crete. And then I sat on the expert working group for the development of the California Low Carbon Fuel Standard. And of late, I was at the uh, um, Committee on Life Cycle Modeling for the National Academies of Sciences on Low Carbon Transportation Fuel. So that's a little bit my background. Uh, that's outstanding, and, and uh, just to reiterate what Luke said, we're excited to have you here. Yeah, you know, I've, I've 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 long wanted to learn more about the CI score myself, uh, but uh, the, really the way you put it, that life cycle modeling, I think, is so important. Um, you know, I kind of equate it to we all talk about electric vehicles and how great the batteries are, and there's no emission. Right. Well, that's in the confines of that vehicle itself, but everything that went into generating the power to gen, you know, powerize. Uh, power the, uh, the the battery the, the, the oh. manufacturer the car that's the full life cycle so when we're talking about CI score in the terms of carbon carbon uh, carbon dioxide carbon sequestration carbon production uh, oh. and it's really about that right it's not just at that facility it's everything that you did to make whatever product or, or the lower carbon footprint things like that so as best as I understand it CI score is kind of the way of the future like that is our way of quantifying how good of a job we're doing I, at the end of the day on, on controlling emissions. And so we can compare product A to product B based on that full life cycle. Would that be a fair assessment? And, yeah, and let me, with that as well, Stefan, is it, you have this assessment of what? Is it of a business? Is it of a process? Like simplistically, yeah. where does that CI score get stamped? So, so for example, um, we can we can of interest for this topic, right? Is for example the CI or carbon intensity of a fuel produced, right? And so, for example, we can we can compare the life cycle emissions of corn ethanol or cellulosic ethanol compared to gasoline compared to an electric vehicle that's fueled by electricity, right? And uh, the metric that we are using there is, for example, grams of carbon dioxide uh, emitted per megajoule, or meaning the heat heating content of a fuel, right? And so for, for corn ethanol, for example, we look at the whole life cycle. Um, you know, emissions emitted during corn farming, including the fertilizer or the tractor fuel use, then the emissions emitted to turn the corn uh, at an ethanol plant uh, into, into ethanol, and then the transportation of the finished ethanol to uh, the gas station, right? And then the combustion in the vehicle. Now for corn ethanol, right? Because the corn is basically carbon neutral, right? The carbon in the corn was absorbed during the growth of the corn and then released during combustion. So that, that corn is carbon neutral, but all emissions come, during, come in during the production of corn ethanol, like, like I explained. Uh, when we compare this to petroleum-based fuels, right? 
the carbon from petroleum is, is, has been stored in geological formations for millions of years, right? So it's a release uh, and add, added, um, adding of the carbon to the atmosphere, a net addition of the carbon to the atmosphere. Um, but, uh, but in addition to that, there, there are some uh, additional emissions from, from crude oil refining, and all of those get added up again in the life cycle for petroleum-based fuels, and then we compare them on a one-to-one -one basis using the, the unit of gram CO2 emitted per megajoule. Yeah, no, that's, that's, uh, so at the end of the day today, what is, what's our, our best fuel source from a carbon intensity score? And, and do you see in the markets, in the industry, are we really using this today? Or uh, I know you talked about the, the low carbon fuel standards from California. I know they focus on, on that CI score a lot. Is, is anybody else doing that across the nation, across the country? Is there a standardized valuation that is being used in this equation? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's many uh, voluntary and as well as regulatory efforts, you know, that, that use basically life cycle modeling in the evaluation and incentives that they provide, uh, you know, to in incentivize certain clean transportation options. We're focusing on transportation for now, right? Um, and, and so there's a California low carbon fuel standard, um, that's a re uh, renewable uh, portfolio standard, that's a national U.S. national program, there's the Canadian Clean Fuel Standard. There's Renova Bio in, in Brazil, you know, that encourages mostly ethanol production. Um, in the EU, we have the Renewable Energy Directive uh, that encourages clean transportation fuels, um, including, for example, um, uh, you know, ethanol-based uh, ethanol fuels, but also electric vehicles. Uh, and then there is the uh, um, Japanese uh, biofuels policy, uh, that that in, uh, encourages blending of ETBE um, into the biofuels, uh, ETBE made from corn or, or sugarcane ethanol. So there's there's a lot of different uh, regulatory standards around the world that 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 uh, you know provide regulatory incentives. Uh, but then there's also all the voluntary carbon standards you know that encourage you know yeah. for example low carbon transportation fuels or biobased products. So I wonder how that positions us as an importer or an exporter, uh, kind of future focused, but for now, what, what is the, is it a, is it a penalty to not be using X percent of fuel that have, you know, a certain score that you need to be beneath? Let's take California for an example. That's an easy one right now, right? We've talked about this. What does this mean? If you're, you know, it costs more to produce this fuel, are we going to be paying more at the pump? But there's a threshold that California must meet. Can you speak specifically on that? Yeah, I mean, California has a low carbon fuel standard, which is a performance-based standard, right? So basically, if you look at a gallon of liquid fuel um, or then the, the, the equivalent of an electric fuel, right? Uh, put, put on the same standard metric, like I, like I just, just mentioned, right? So California encourages that, that a volume of fuel has low carbon meaning reduces carbon relatively to a petroleum-based baseline, you know, that's been set in the standard. So, so anytime a, a, a fuel uh, marketer can show that a volume of fuel that he is marketing, he or she is marketing, has a, a low carbon intensity on a life cycle basis, that is basically, uh, you know, basically get, gets rewarded for that, for blending low carbon fuel. Um, and that's ultimately then again mandated by uh, by the low carbon fuel standard um, regulation. But at, at the end of the day, in California, under that regulation, they have a target of their blended weighted average of all fuels right. consumed must be under yes. the threshold X. No, so the only yeah. way to get there is some of these biofuels. Correct. Yeah. And on a declining basis, basically each year the threshold or the baseline tightens up, right? Gets more strict. And so overall, right, that, that encourages fuel producers to decarbonize their supply. So right now, are we importing then from Brazil? Are we importing from some of these places that do have a lower, lower carbon intensity while we put the infrastructure in place? Yes. So most, most for example, on, on the ethanol side, right? Most, most ethanol is met with U.S.-based corn ethanol. But there is some imports going on currently of sugarcane 
produced ethanol from Brazil because it's got a lower carbon score than, you know, several of the plants in the United States that produce ethanol from corn. So what, what's the biggest step for a U.S. ethanol producer to lower their CI score? So I know right now during the fermentation process, a lot of CO2 is, is exhausted mostly to the atmosphere. Uh, there's a lot of conversation in that market and that industry yeah. of sequestration into the pipelines yeah. long term. So is that the biggest thing that, that they can do uh, in, in our ethanol? Is that you know, one of the, the leading, yeah. I mean, we're number one or number two ethanol producer in the world, I believe. Yeah. So obviously, that's an important market for us. What can they do? Yeah. So, so just, yeah, U.S. is by far the largest ethanol producer followed, uh, corn ethanol producer or ethanol producer followed by Brazil, which is the second largest ethanol producer. Brazilian ethanol is dominated by sugarcane as a feedstock. U.S. is dominated by corn. So to answer your question, uh, there's several things that can be done, right? So um, the... The, uh, the CI or carbon intensity of U.S.-based corn ethanol has been trending downward significantly, right? And, and there's a couple of reasons for that. A, farmers or growers, corn farmers, have become so much more efficient in growing corn, right? Fuel use has been reduced. Fertilizer has been reduced over the last 10, 15 years tremendously, right? We got new seed treatments, right, that are more... That, you know, that are more efficient in, in nutrient use, water use, etc. So significant reductions uh, on the corn side, corn production side, plus you got uh, carbon sequestration effects going into the soil, right? And a lot of regulatory schemes are actually considering quantifying that in life cycle modeling. Then ethanol plants themselves, the biorefineries, have gotten much more efficient, right? Much better heat integration of the process, um, better enzymes that, that, that provide higher yields of, uh, of ethanol per unit corn, uh, per, per unit um, corn, corn coming in, right? So there's a lot uh, corn ethanol producers have done. The next frontier is carbon sequestration. And so, as I mentioned, while the carbon in, in, in uh, ethanol is already carbon neutral because it got absorbed, uh, you know, from the atmosphere and re-released during combustion, there's also fermentation CO2 being released during the fermentation process, right? It's also carbon from the corn gets released during the fermentation process during, because it's alcohol fermentation, right? Releases carbon, carbon dioxide. It is a, a, a very pu a relatively pure uh, source of carbon dioxide already that's used in the food industry and for other products, um, you know, for, for dry ice making, for concrete curing, um, and many applications already for this relatively clean carbon dioxide, and one of the next frontiers is sequestering it into geological foundation or for enhanced oil recovery. So, Stefan, obviously, if I'm an ethanol producer, I'm in the business of producing ethanol, and CO2 is a byproduct. Right now, some of it goes to the market. As you noted, it's relatively clean. Some of it is off gas. But if you're now incentivized to lower your carbon intensity score, we have the sequestration, we've identified, you know, the geological domes that can hold the CO2. And I, as this ethanol producer, start to capture my CO2 and send it into a pipeline, into a truck to be sequestered. Am I ultimately getting a premium now on the ethanol I'm producing? Oh, what does that, you know, what does that look like? Do we start to export that? Because I'm just wondering, why would I not then capture all of my CO2 if it's ultimately feeding the price of what I'm producing as my yeah. core business? So, yeah. So a lot of the regulatory, it's very good questions. A lot of those regulatory um, schemes that I mentioned earlier, like the California Low Carbon Fuel Standard, the EU uh, Renewable Energy Directives, um, they have provisions for uh, carbon, you know, that is sequestered uh, for carbon uh, capture uh, and sequestration, right? So which includes geological sequestration, obviously, in uh, um, informations. And the, the credit for that can be quite significant. Right. So um, if, if you picture, for example, and, and I'm going to state some numbers, some rough numbers. So let's say your, your petroleum based uh, gasoline has a carbon score of 80, 90 to 100 grams of CO2 per megajoule. Right. Your ethanol somewhere has a, has a, has a carbon intensity, let's say 40 to 60 grams per megajoule, depending on, you know, what model you use and how you're modeling it and under which regulatory scheme it varies. So let's let's say 40 to 60 grams per megajoule. So your, your ethanol has about 
roughly half of the emissions of gasoline, carbon emissions of gasoline, right? Now, if you sequester the fermentation CO2, you can get an additional credit of about 25 to 50, uh, 20, 25 to 30 grams per megajoule. So you're cutting your carbon intensity again by at least in half, right? Um, so it's, and, and that can provide a significant credit uh, under, under regulatory schemes. Uh, and, and a lot of them are, are still finalizing, you know, how they're monitoring it, how they, uh, how they assess how they assess the credit, but there's a lot of potential there. And especially when we compare the carbon score, for example, to sugarcane ethanol, as I mentioned earlier, which scores lower currently uh, for many plants than corn-based ethanol, all of a sudden you're looking better than sugarcane-based ethanol on a world market, right? And then uh, global regulatory schemes will look very, very favorably all of a sudden at US-based corn ethanol. And their exporting then starts to make sense for those users because it brings down their overall blended CI yeah. score to a point where they want to come to the U.S. Yeah. Yes. Wow. Well, That's yeah, correct. That brings up a great point because, you know, I, I've always felt that Europe is just much farther down the path of, of uh, you know, carbon reduction, carbon emission reduction than, than where the U.S. is. And a lot of that is because their system's much more punitive where the system in the U.S., generally speaking, isn't all that punitive yet. Uh, you look at 45Q, we're gonna incentivize you to sequester, but you're really not getting punit punitively damaged for doing it. The CI score starts to kind of do that a little bit more, uh, not maybe as a direct tax it, but the value of your product or the opportunity to export it to other places, that becomes an impactful. So it would be like you just said, you can, the lower your score, the more open market you have, um, so I kind of transition, I know this isn't directly in your realm, but uh, you talk about like biogases coming off landfills or dairy farms, things like that. You, you know, there is a big push, especially in Europe. That's a huge growing market. It's really starting to materialize here more and more in the U.S. to capture what we call RNG, re renewable natural gas. So you're capturing that methane. And so by using that methane as your power source, I'm assuming that's yeah. going to dramatically lower your your uh, CI score, but also if you capture the CO2 off of that and either sequester it or put it into other applications, uh, that all additionally lowers that CI score. That, would that be accurate? That, that is correct, yeah. So, you know, you can capture, like, let's say, a farm level uh, digesters, right? Taking the manure and, and, and producing, uh, for example, digester gas, right? If you use that, right, you, you definitely, uh, if you use that in a, in a, an ethanol facility, right, as, a, as an input to produce a thermal energy, uh, that would definitely uh, significantly lower, significantly lower your, uh, your carbon intensity, right? Because all of a sudden you're not emitting methane from these digesters, for example, on farms, right, or from, from landfills. You're putting it to productive use, right? And that also has a very high value under, under the, uh, the California uh, low carbon fuel markets. I've actually written a publication many, many years ago, probably close to 18 years ago, called Manure's Allure on, on that particular topic of, of using a digester gas as, um, as, a, as an energy feedstock. we got to get you to marketing. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm thinking about one thing, right? You talk about the incentive of a lower CI score when it comes to ethanol production and, and how you could certainly be paid a premium. We've been saying with 45Q that the floor is $85. We haven't even talked about 45Q. We're just talking about what having a lower CI yeah. score does to Correct. You, which you can sell your ethanol for. Now tack on $85 a ton per sequestration. Yeah. I mean, to me, the floor is potentially not the $85, yeah. but the additional uh, premium that you get for yeah. the yeah. sale of the cost of not doing it. And that's, that's yeah. what I'm saying. I think it's, it, it, it starts to get us in a punitive way without overly taxing. But you know, we, we have a saying here that you, know, you have to be in the you have to be in the black if you want to be in the green. If it's not profitable, ultimately the green initiatives will will fail. Uh, you know, yep. we can't we can't government subsidize this forever. We're all for sequestration right. and it has its place. But at the end of the day, well, I mean, what, you know, what I used to say, at least on this side of it, rather than then frack and pull more, you know, natural gas out of existing yeah. wells and for a million years, use the natural gas that we have. And we yeah. have the methane coming off of, you know, landfills and, and dairy farms and other digesters. We have other opportunities. We can capture, we can capture and lower, you know, keep using the, the ethanol that we're using, uh -huh. just use a more
or efficient or a lower carbon intense uh, ethanol, that's ultimately going to get us you know, a good portion of the way to you know carbon neutrality and globally yeah. by 2050. Uh, sequestration is still always going to be a part of that. Yeah. I just don't believe that we can keep subsidizing these markets and industries globally with just making everything more expensive is not yeah. viable. In terms. So. so yeah, I, I would I would absolutely agree with you. But I do think let's not forget uh, you know there's also obviously incentives for new products from carbon dioxide, right? And um, the, uh, the for example you know fermentation co2 at ethanol plants is in my opinion can be viewed as a resource it's relatively pure right that's and and uh, you know the 45q and 45z tax credit really provide incentives for people to be innovative right for the us industry um, refining ethanol refining industry to be innovative come up with new products that we can produce with carbon dioxide Right, and and I think that that will ultimately yield uh, a big boost here to, to to innovation and and the U.S. economy and the farming economy, and bring back money to the rural economies where biorefineries are are situated and keep those refineries competitive. Right, we got to keep liquid biofuels around because they have benefits. Um, you know, also against uh, electrification. Right, we cannot put all our eggs in one basket and just yeah. And just bank on electrification and electric vehicles, right? We have the potential here in the United States to produce low carbon ethanol, right? Take advantage of these innovative uh, tax, tax incentives, right, for new products. And uh, that will enable us to keep ethanol as a liquid fuel uh, around for many years to come as a low carbon uh, alternative to just electric vehicles. Right. Yeah, right, yeah, we got firm belief of the the all of the above strategy because yeah, I mean, what's what you didn't mention there also is hydrogen as well. There is a, there's certainly a place for electric vehicles. Uh, there's going to be a place for hydrogen vehicles and the higher hydrogen as a power source, but also the renewable natural gas. I mean, I think the bottom line is if we're not drilling for new, if use the existing, that we don't have to convert everything over. And and from that, you know, the 45Q and and and, and be uh, you know like I, I I'm an advocate of it from the if it's sparking innovation. If it's just let's pay people to put CO2 into the ground and hope it goes away, but we don't do anything on the backside to, to reduce it, then it's, you know, we're just going to produce more CO2. So, you know, yeah, you say, you know, making these, you know, just like you look at hydrogen, it's extremely expensive yeah. today relative to the, you know, the, the, um, uh, you know, the, the gas equivalent yeah. cost per cost, but it can get there with enough innovation, enough investment. So if this gives a, a bridge yeah. to get us there, that's great. And the CI score is kind of a nice, Seems like a nice low path to get us there, as opposed to just, you know, you're going to be taxed if you don't do X, Y, and Z. Yeah. Which seems like a little bit of the we've almost had as a country a knee jerk reaction to go all battery and all electric yeah. just for that reason. It's the easy answer, but at the end of the day, you know, if you have dirty, dirty fuel or dirty energy source creating that power that's you know that's powering that battery, then yeah. you really didn't solve anything. That's we correct. We could driving down the road, but we didn't solve anything globally. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, the CI store po forces honesty. Yeah. Uh, looking at the yeah. So, yeah. so, are you uh, at the end of the day? Are you a, a huge advocate of CI store? Do you believe it? Is there things that we can improve upon it, or you know, why isn't it more national and why is it more in California and not more of a national standard? Well, I mean, we have the renewable portfolio standard, which is a national standard encouraging biofuel use. But, you know, and there is a carbon component, a volumetric uh, scoring of, uh, of, of ethanol, different, different biofuel types, I should say, not just ethanol, but also biodiesel, renewable diesel, right? Uh, the volumetric uh, requirements involved under the renewable portfolio standard that set targets of volumes blended into the national U.S. fuel supply, right? That's administered by the EPA. So we do have, in that vein, a sort of a national program. Um, and then we've got the regional, regional low-carbon fuel standards. It's not California. It's also Washington State. It's, it's Oregon. Uh, then we go into Canada, like I mentioned before, right? We got, we, got, we got a lot of regulatory standards. I think there's some national potential national developments. Um, there's a Midwestern group that, that explores the formation of a Midwestern low-carbon fuel standard. So, I mean, uh, you know, there's various low-carbon low fuel standard uh, developments and, and, and existing structures um, that, that are in place. And then you got the ones that I mentioned on an international level, uh, on an international level as well. I think the, the goal, obviously, is to, to decarbonize the transportation sector, 
right, to watch carbon, um, to reduce the climate impact um, of carbon emissions, and to find an, an, an efficient way to doing it, right? And so low carbon fuel standards, again, is a performance-based standard uh, that rewards uh, use, use of low carbon uh, feedstocks, you know, and, and again, as I mentioned before, you know, you got your biofuels are a good low carbon option, right? If and, and life cycle modeling is a good way of comparing all these different um, uh, transportation fuel options on a one-to-one -one basis, on a consistent basis, right? How does a, how does a, a biofuel car compare to a gasoline car, to a diesel powered car, um, to an electric vehicle, right? The carbon score, the life cycle analysis allows you to do this on a consistent basis because we take all emissions into account along the production chain of a fuel. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, very well said. Yeah. Right. Well, that's a, a great, uh, as I, said, I think that's a great closing place. Is there anything, uh, any important topic point that we didn't make in all this or that was a great education for us? No, oh, thank you for having me on this uh, this pop podcast. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity here to uh, promote and talk a little bit about my research. And uh, yeah, yeah, thank absolutely. you very much. Where, where can uh, where can people find you? Find more information about you? Find some of your papers? Well, you can you know you can uh, Google um, uh, UIC Biofuels Bioenergy Research, and um, yeah, you should that should give you access to my publications and you know the news on on my research. No, that's outstanding. Awesome. So we'll get uh, connected offline to help you think of some sort of rhyme for the name of this episode. Uh, but other than that, he, he nailed it before. So <laughs> thank, you, thank you so much for joining us, Doctor. We yeah. appreciate the time. We will connect here soon. I know the audience will find this insightful. Take care, sir. Absolutely. Appreciate yeah. It. Thanks. Thank you.